Yu-Gi-Oh! It's a franchise that stood the test of time, and for better or worse, has been fun to talk about on the channel. Although I would guess that at least one of my editors is plotting my demise for having them edit so many Yu-Gi-Oh videos. But I figured I'd take my chances and talk about some of the Yu-Gi-Oh video games. I mean, I'm not gonna touch Master Duel for a while, mainly because the cancer that is Tiaramence that has already infested the game. So I figured we'd take a look into the distant past and talk about a few of the older Yu-Gi-Oh games. One that too many has been long sealed away in a tomb within our memories. A forbidden memory, one might say. What the hell? Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories, the topic of today's video, was a game for the original PlayStation that came out in 1999 in Japan. And for us filthy gun-slinging Americans, it was 2002. It was one of the earliest Yu-Gi-Oh! video games that many people from the 90s can remember, and to be honest, it really shows its age. When the game came out, it was met with mixed reviews, being released way back into the Duel Monsters age of Yu-Gi-Oh! Even the rules for Forbidden Memories itself reflects that to a degree. And you really only need to look towards some of the character designs and how they have that old retro look, or how they have some oddities here. For example, look at Isis, who is obviously supposed to be a Shizu Ishtar, only with evil eyes. Or the fact that certain characters are in completely non-canon events. Job. There's about as much continuity in this timeline as there is if you tried to make sense of every piece of macaroni art you made as a kid. Basically, continuity with original Duel Monsters canon ain't gonna happen. The only continuity you're gonna get is that Duelist of the Roses is canon to this game. And that for some reason, Prince Henry Tudor suddenly thinks that mulling your hair after Patrick Starr is the greatest fashion statement of all time. The story is also really bare bones, and it amounts to being some abridged fanfiction that someone who drunkenly skimmed over the entire Duel Monsters script would have wrote. The only thing you're here for is the gameplay. Oh, and the music too, I guess. <laughs> Contrary to what reviewer scores say, Forbidden Memories has an interesting gameplay loop to it. Now, if you think you're throwing down about $400 in order to play Kash Tira and essentially make it so your opponent can't play Yu-Gi-Oh! is gonna help you here, you're either delusional or you've never played this game. Considering how old this game is, I'm assuming you're basically sucking a pacifier and going, Mommy, who is this mean old man mewing at me? So let me tell you now. The rules have said, screw your money set to I am the rules. And those rules are also kind of broken too. Now, in the original Yu-Gi-Oh! manga, monsters were essentially just the canes that the rich old guy and something like Oliver Twist would bludgeon his wife with. And whoever had the bigger number was going to be the winner. At least until the creator of Yu-Gi-Oh! Rest in peace, my lord and savior, Kazuki Takahashi, changed the manga to follow the card game because it got super popular. The same thing can apply here. And much like the early manga and anime editions of the game, stars on a monster are just decorations. The higher the star rating, the brighter the Christmas tree, basically. You don't need to tribute cards in order to play stronger ones. Monsters don't have effects, and every time you start your turn, you draw to you have five cards in your hand. It basically did what Yu-Gi-Oh! 7s did before 7s. Yay! Other changes that were applied is that you can only play one card per turn onto the field, so you can either play a monster, spell, or trap card once per turn. Grand, if you're starting to get one too many cards in your hand for your liking, there's a neat little trick that you can do that my ad likes to call BULLSH! <coughs> I mean, fusion. Fusion, in the original TCG, was basically when you used a special spell card to combine two monsters into a brand new one. It was a very common thing to see this in decks at the time. But in this awkward PS1 game, it was quite a weird oddity. Aside from the fact there's no need for a spell card to activate fusion, and merely requires you to move the cursor to the cards you want in selecting them with the up button, there are some very weird and random fusion results you can get. Mind you, it wasn't always nonsensical. For example, combining a dragon and a thunder monster to get thunder dragon, or the superior twin-headed thunder dragon, or combining a fire monster with a warrior will get you a fire warrior like flame swordsman. But if you're not careful when you combine cards, it can bite you in the ass. The way this works is that if you have a combination that ends up being wrong, then whichever card was played first will be discarded. In almost every way, fusion is your go-to trump card for a majority of the game, and the results can be life-saving. But let's say the card you got isn't enough, and you know it. You're biting your nails, wondering what to do. You have what it takes to make a twin-headed thunder dragon, but your opponent has a black skull dragon. Your measly twin-headed good boy ain't gonna cut it! But then... 
like a light in a dark void. Something catches your eye. That's right, you see the one, the only, Bright Castle! You have at your disposal what are known as spell and trap cards. Much like the actual game, you can play a variety of spell or traps, all of them offering just as many effects that can range from stat buffs to stat debuffs for your opponent, all the way to nuking an entire field. Let's say you play a field spell which can power up some monsters by 500 points or lower the power of some monsters. Some monsters will get a buff, but others might get nothing, or get worse. So playing stuff like fairies or machines are honestly a detriment to play since they're more often than not be at a disadvantage. Equip spells, however, are more often your best bet for turning a bad situation around since they allow you to power up your monsters usually by 500 points each. Although Megamorph will boost your monster by two, meaning it's double the normal stat buff. But you also have to be careful because some equipped cards cannot be used on some monsters. And some cards are just completely useless. Take the Ritual cards for example. Much like in real life Yu-Gi-Oh, Ritual this cards aren't great. Not only due to the fact that you need to have three separate and specific monsters on the field, some of which are incredibly hard to get on their own, but Rituals are essentially phased out because you're better off just trying to get the monster cards themselves. Let's give an example. Let's say you want to play Magician of Black Chaos, and for some reason you've consumed enough alcohol to get it via Ritual Summoning. You need the following cards. Winged Dragon of the Fortress 1. Okay, that makes sense since that was a card in the original Yugi's deck and was the first monster he ever played in the anime, but... Blast Juggler is also one of those cards. For some damn reason. I guess the developers decided to huff some of Blast Juggler's special fuel. And then there's Dark Magician. Now, you may be thinking to yourselves, Oh, that doesn't sound too bad, you're just complaining about collecting cards. <laughs> oh, you sweet, demented fools and ignorant children. Here's the thing, if you know anything about Yu-Gi-Oh, you're probably thinking to yourself that probably the hardest card to get in this game is Dark Magician. And don't get me wrong, we'll talk about card drops in a little bit, but there are only about four opponents that you can possibly, and I mean POSSIBLY, get the card from. Either in the campaign or in Free Duel, where you'll spend most of your time in the game. But here's the kicker. You can never play the Ritual spell because you can't get Winged Dragon number one in this game. Forbidden Memories has a total of 722 cards in the game, however 33 of those cards are unattainable in the western releases of it. You can only get 689 of those cards! Hell, you can't even get the Dark Magic Ritual card because of this. Even the game's auto-win condition, Exodia, is locked behind this with two of its pieces being a part of the 33 locked cards. Now, you may be wondering yourself, why are these 33 cards unattainable in a game that's essentially a prehistoric gotcha game from the Yu-Gi-Oh! Dark Ages, where the point is to get the cards? Well, to make a long story short, there was a device called the Pocket Station. It was a Japanese memory card peripheral that allowed you to play small mini-games on it and access specialized content for certain games. And it was only available in Japan. And once you know it, Forbidden Memories was one of those games. And unfortunately, those who got the game in the US and Europe got screwed over twofold! The first is that Sony never released the Pocket Station outside of Japan. Duh! And the second was, even if you got your hands on a Pocket Station for those secret cards, Konami themselves removed the support of the Pocket Station from Forbidden Memories. Although, funnily enough, games like Final Fantasy VIII, even when localized, still had the Pocket Station support in it. So, for a card collecting game, this is nothing short of a pure WHAT THE F***! From me, and anyone who knows about this. Sir, I've removed the pocket station stuff from the Yu-Gi-Oh game. Good, now ship this crap out. But sir, I still have to program the cards that were on the pocket station. To quote a certain someone, WHAT WERE THEY THINKING?! Thank God for mods! Now here's a joke to lighten the mood a bit. Card drops in forbidden memories! <laughs> <laughs> that was a lie. It's not even a joke. There is a card drop system, and it's bad. So for the uninitiated, I'm gonna explain how to get cards. First, there's the drop mechanic. The joke. Whenever you defeat an opponent, depending on how you do in the game, you'll get a rank, and that'll determine two of your prizes. What card you get as a reward, and the number of star chips, which can be used to get you more cards. That's right. MORE CARDS! <laughs> but while the drop system was a joke, this next method of getting cards is even more akin to a nightmare!
You see, back in the day, if you had the actual cards, you could input the numbers on the card's left corner into a good number of Yu-Gi-Oh games you can actually get the card for yourself to use in them. It was a simple thing that really tied the TCG to the video game counterpart, something that the current games don't actually do. And I know what you're thinking, well, there you go, Common, now you can get the better cards. You just gotta grind. However, you are so wrong that you make me want to bust out a dead meme. You see, in the infinite wisdom of the Konami developers, they decided to make the prizes for a number of iconic cards be a pretty hefty penny, even for cards that aren't that good. And what number was this hefty cost at? Well, I'll tell you this much, Thanos doesn't think it was worth it. Hell no! No! Oh my f God, do you see this? It's bad enough that you can only get a max of five chips per victory, but 999,999 ,999 star chips? If you convert this many star chips to dollars, you'd be looking at the same price Elon uh, Musk spent on purchasing exactly Twitter. Exactly. So if you wanted to spend time getting enough star chips for this, you'd be looking at yourself in the mirror when you're geriatric by the time you got a single good card. If you're a fresh young kid, and have even a single good card from this system, then you <laughs> might as well roll me up in a Bugatti and say, what shade of white is your blue eyes white dragon? So as you can see, your access to some cards is nearly impossible. So unless you can use a game shark or you can mod the game, you're kinda screwed. Of course, that's not the only way the game cheats you. It's just one of the biggest middle fingers that this game likes to give people. But here's the thing, the game can be tolerable if you manage to get the right cards. For example, your starting deck is randomized, and if you can make this card, you at the very least stand a chance. The busted fusion mechanic allows you to take any dragon that has over 1600 attack points and any thunder monster, then you can create this 2800 ton battleship and mop up the early parts of the game fairly easily even without many equips. Or so you think. So here's the thing about Forbidden Memories. When you're playing the game and the last parts of the prologue set up, there's quite a bit of a jump in difficulty. And it's all thanks to this guy, Haitian. I think that's how you pronounce it. One of the major antagonists of the game. And it's basically an early sneak peek into the difficulty of the latter half of the overall game. And here's something I need to explain to you. If you lose any duel in the campaign, save for this one scripted one against Haysen, that's it. You're done. This isn't too bad if you do save every so often. However, in the latter half, you have to deal with the high mages and their lackeys. At the temples, each representing one of the different field spells in the game, you need to defeat the lackey, then the mage. Then you can leave after you beat the lackey, but if you do and return to the temple, you're gonna be facing the lackey again. You gotta beat the high mage too at the same time, otherwise you'll be stuck. And some of these mages pack as much punch as Haitian. And our good boy here just ain't gonna cut it by himself. It might not be a terrible challenge for some, but considering what my editor went through in an old Let's Play he did, Oh my fucking god! What? <laughs> for some, it's an Eldritch Nightmare. But I also bring this up because of the final gauntlet. You see, for the final part of the game, you need to face off against six opponents without saving. So if you lose to one of them, then you're out. And this sucks because these guys have the best cards in the game, including the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, a monster that has 4,500 attack points. And that wouldn't be so bad, but the AI cheats. Yeah, you heard me. This game legit cheats you. You remember when I brought up Game Shark? Well, there's a code that allows you to see what cards your opponent has in their hand, and it was confirmed that the game will actively change the cards in their hands in order to counter your stronger monsters. The game literally pulls a bandit Keith on your ass. So, this game is actively kicking you in the balls and shoving a hot fireplace poker up your ass, while expecting you to sit there and beg for more. It will do whatever it can to screw you over. It's hard, very hard, unreasonably hard even. But it's not impossible. There are a few tips that you can do in order to maximize your chances to beat this dirty cheater. Tip number one, you need Regeki or Black Hole. Remember when I talked about how your starter deck was randomized? Yeah, much like how a ton of Pokemon players will farm starters to get a shiny or the right nature, you want to do the same with your starting deck to have either of these cards. Raigeki is a spell that destroys all your opponent's monsters, meanwhile Dark Hole destroys everything. Raigeki is the obvious better pick since you don't run the risk of destroying any of your cards, but Black Hole is your next best option. Tip number two, Farm Simon. 
So, this one can be missed, since at the start of the campaign, you run away from a guy named Simon Murad. He's the first duelist in the game that you can challenge, and once you do, you can farm him in free duel, which can get you a lot of cards that are useful for the early game. And get some star chips, too. Tip number three, Fusion Rules! You want to really utilize the fusion mechanic pretty quick, as it allows you to create powerful cards from weaker ones. I already brought up the Twin Headed Thunder Dragon example, but if you combine plants with a zombie, you get Pump King, the King of Ghosts. Fusing a plant and a dragon will net you be Dragon Jungle King, and combining a zombie and a dragon will get you Curse a Dragon depending on certain factors. Those factors being that you need to consider the attack points of your monsters before fusing them. If, for example, we have a dragon and a plant looking to make be Dragon Jungle King, either of them have more than 2100 base attack points, that fusion will fail. Oh, and two things that the game doesn't tell you is that some cards are multi-typed, and the game will always go with the weakest result when you fuse with them. So if you had Dragon Zombie, a card that counts for fusion for a dragon and a zombie type, if you combine it with a Thunder Monster, you'll get Twin Headed Thunder Dragon. Tip number four, get Jirai Gumo. Okay, so this is basically an easy card to get that has high attack value. Nightmare Fuel over here is a 2200 attacker that gains advantage in the forest and oddly enough is really cheap to get via the password for about 80 star chips. That's about 16 5 star duels to get and it isn't hard to achieve. It's a strong card that doesn't need fusion to make. Tip number 5, Guardian Stars. So here's something that I missed earlier but each card has two Guardian Stars to them. Think of them as elements and each star is strong against another and this is shown whenever you battle an opponent. What happens is that if a monster has a stronger Guardian Star than the other, it gains 500 attack during the battle. But here's a diagram on screen to sh explain it. Think of it like typing in Pokemon. The Water Star beats the Fire Star. Sorry Charizard, but Blastoise beats you! And word of advice, the CPU will typically pick the default Guardian Star. Take advantage of it! Tip number 6. Farm the Meadow Mage! For some damn reason, this ugly SOB here has the best drops in the entire game. I'm not kidding! When you get to the second half of the game, go to the Meadow Temple, beat this loser the first time, leave, and go farm and free duel! If you can get high ranks against this guy, he'll drop cards such as the Dark Magician, Guy of the Fierce Knight, and of course, the GOAT! THE GOAT! This is Meteor Black Dragon, a card that by itself can pretty much win all but one fight without a single equip card. Blue Eyes White Dragon, TRASH! Gate Guardian, with the Sun Guardian he went from being the Gatekeeper to being Gate Kept. Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon? Yeah, you're gonna need like three Bright Casts to do this. So yeah, the Goat of Free Duels. I don't know why he drops the best cards in the game, but he just does! Tip number seven, Farm Pegasus for Spells. So, in order to do this tip, you're gonna have to beat your opponent by deck out. And in this case, we're talking Pegasus. There are two different classifications to get the S rank. Power, abbreviated as POW, where you get to beat your opponent in a few turns through raw brute force, and Tech, where you deck out your opponent. Essentially, you're great for flexing your skill rather than your big fat meat stick. S Tech, however, takes a good while since your opponent is running about a 40 card deck, but you can get some pretty good spell cards. Hell, if you've been grinding, you can get yourself a Bright Castle Equip spell that I mentioned before, which can power up any monster by 500 points. And Pegasus is the one character who drops it the most, if you get the S-Tech. I'd recommend you farm some good OP monsters that keep him on the defensive after he wastes a few cards in fusion, since you draw as many cards as the fusion wasted. Just don't fuse anything yourself. Tip number 8. After you beat about two high mages, you can unlock an easily missable duel against Seto one of the final boss rush additions. The Labyrinth Mage is also a part of the story section, and if you do this, you'll remove one part of the boss rush. Granted, this is for a game that's well over 20 years old at this point, but people are still playing this game to this day. And hell, there's a healthy mod community for it. One mod that really works is the five card drop, which, if the name didn't give it away, whenever you beat an opponent, you get five cards instead of one. And one mod that I personally like is FM Arrange. Not only does it have a five card drop, but also included new cards from the other generations of Yu-Gi-Oh, 
has a bit more balance on strong cards, made the card prices a bit more manageable, makes the card text much more understandable, and overall I find it to be a much more fun experience. AI still cheats like a bitch though. In any case, if you guys want to get the chance, go find yourself a ROM and emulator to play this game. Or if you want to slog through the original, then you can always pick up a copy from Amazon. I see used copies on there going for about 60 to 70 dollars. Honestly, a reasonable price. Or I'm just a simp for nostalgia. Either way, with that, I bid you adieu. I'm Manga Common, and remember that you too could be the reincarnation of an ancient Egyptian prince. Either that or a little nobody like Joey Wheeler. <laughs>